It's a pleasure to welcome Alexandru Sarescu from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, who will tell us about a pair correlation surface for, uh, associated to the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Right. Uh, thank you very much. And first of all, I, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. First of all, I wanted to, to thank uh, Peter and the organizers for uh, this invitation. Let me share my screen. Uh, so this is a uh, joint work with, uh, with Dev, with Cruz, and with Dee. Uh, they are uh, currently uh, PhD students, graduate students here at uh, here in our department. Um, so so this is about um, a surface. We can call it like that. We discover a surface related to the pair correlation of zeros of the Riemann zeta function. We make a conjecture on the shape of this surface and present uh, some partial results and also numerical evidence uh, towards the conjecture. Uh, concerning numerical evidence, um, so in the last part of the talk, uh, Cruz will. Uh, talk about medical evidence he will show us some uh, some pictures that he made and uh, explain how this is how this is done numerically um so let me jump over uh, these uh, first slides and uh, start with montgomery uh who studied in 19 i mean 1973 study pair correlation the Riemann zeta function in order to do this, um, he looks at the Fourier transform, this distribution. He considers this function. He takes a large number, capital T. He assumes the Riemann, the Riemann hypothesis throughout the paper. So zeros, a zero row looks like this, is one half plus, I, I mean, the non-trivial zero. So one half plus I gamma. So gamma for him is an imaginary part of uh, non-trivial zero of a Riemann zeta function. So he looks at this double sum, sum over gamma, sum over gamma prime, both of them run over the imaginary parts of all the zeros between uh, zero and capital T. Um, then we have a T to the I alpha times uh, gamma minus gamma prime. So the distance, the vertical distance between the these two zeros. And then we multiply this by this i, by this uh, alpha. And then times the weight function, w, which he chooses to be <clears throat> four over four plus u squared, which uh, we also do, we work with exactly the same uh, weight function. So we notice that uh, assuming the Riemann hypothesis, so uh, this gamma, gamma and gamma prime, real numbers, the difference is a real number. And then if you replace this u by gamma minus gamma prime, we get something real and positive, which has a maximum at u equals zero. And the maximum is w of zero is one, uh, which corresponds to gamma equals gamma prime. So when, when the zeros are close to each other, this is large. And if they are far from each other, this is... Can you move the cursor, whatever that thing's called? Yeah, thank you. Looks like a plus. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can also. Uh, Perfect. Yeah. Um, so, assuming the Riemann hypothesis, then he proves the following, among other things, that f of alpha and t, actually, as t goes to infinity, this has limit. Alpha. Say alpha is a strictly positive uh, real number, we can take alpha to be zero, and also by symmetry, we can take alpha to be negative. But f of alpha t uh, looks like this. He has a term here which becomes small when alpha is fixed and strictly larger than zero, and capital T goes to infinity. The other part is fixed, it's alpha. And there's a little law of one means that this is a quantity that goes to zero as t goes to, as this capital T goes to infinity. And as a result, it's uniform in this, uh, in this range. It's very difficult to push this range to the right. 
by symmetry, you can study exactly in the same way what happens with alpha is between minus one and zero. So in this interval, minus one, one. But if alpha is larger than one, we don't have uh, results like this. I should mention a, a recent uh, result of Baliot, Goldstone, uh, Surya Jaya, and uh, Tunich Butterball. That's similar to Montgomery's result. That's very recent, 2023. Uh, but this doesn't assume the Riemann hypothesis, right? So in this case, you have this uh, function W that it's not necessarily real or positive. But it matches Montgomery's definition in the case when, or uh, if you assume that my hypothesis it matches that the previous definition. So of course it will match the, uh, the limit alpha here. You also have in the, or they also have this first part, that's Montgomery. And then a big O, it, it tells us a bit about how it decays as a function of capital T. And again, this is uniform in zero one. I should mention that when alpha is small, as a function of T, uh, this part becomes large. If we think about alpha is zero, then T to the zero is one. And then you have this one here and you multiply by log T. So, so this is huge, is log T is much larger than a fix, our fixed uh, alpha, which in that case would be zero. So this happens for, for alpha zero or alpha very uh, close to zero, depending on uh, the size of capital T. But in numerical computations, this is important. So this will be seen in some, some pictures. Um, and uh, this is what uh, Montgomery's conjecture is. When alpha is larger than one, the limit exists and it is, as the limit as t goes to infinity, conjecture is in a stronger form, the uniform and so on, in some intervals. But the limit is one instead of alpha. So there is a change in behavior here. And so the, uh, the f of alpha is the function, f of alpha is alpha, and then when alpha is less than one, and then it's one, when alpha is larger than one, at least the conjecture. And then it lead, this leads to uh, Montgomery's percolation conjecture, where we're, uh, uh, so in the percolation problems, we look at the sequence, we look at the, um, um, pairs of elements of the sequence that are say between uh, an alpha and the beta times uh, the average gap between uh, these elements. And the uh, correlation, okay, this alpha has nothing to do with the previous alpha. So, uh, so if you take uh, two say positive numbers, uh, alpha larger than zero and beta larger than alpha, then if we count the number of pairs, this is, counting the number of pairs of zeros with imaginary parts, the zeros of the Riemann zeta function with imaginary parts between zero and capital T that are between alpha. So gamma minus gamma prime is larger than or equal to alpha times the average is the average. We know we have asymptotic formulas for the total number of zeros. Yeah. Yeah. So we can know what, I mean, we know what the average is. Then between alpha times the average and beta times the average, then the limit as t goes to infinity, this limit is an integral. So that's the conjecture, is the integral from alpha to beta of this function. And it's, this is a remarkable conjecture. The, the phenomenon is very remarkable. Um, if we go back here, I just wanted to point out the fact that if instead of say the sequence of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function, we take a, um, a random sequence or we take um, many other sequences of interest in, in number theory. For instance, if you take the sequence of primes and you do the same thing, it's not gonna be this integral. It's gonna be the integral from beta of the, fun the, the function inside, which is the pair correlation function will be just the constant function equal to one. And this happens in a, uh, so-called so Poisson distribution, so in the Poisson process. Although that is still a conjecture in the case of primes, uh, but in many cases, in some cases it's proved. In some cases we have 
conjectures, but in, for most sequences of interest in number theory, so to speak, uh, sequences of interest, we don't have this thing. It's going to be the per, the, the per correlation function is one, and this integral is just beta minus alpha. So what we have is Lobeck measure there. Um, very quickly go over this. Uh, as Dyson observed, and then there's a long story, but I jump over the story to tell you something about what we did. Um, so I'm sure that you know this very well. The Gaussian unitary ensemble. And is a big interest if you think about random matrix theory and so on, and the connections with the Riemann zeta function and connections with more general, more general F functions. But you see the same function that we saw earlier in that integral that appears here. And not only that, but we have very uh, extensive, say, numerical computations done by Odlisko, and then the distribution actually match perfectly. Um, I was thinking that perhaps there are uh, students in the audience, perhaps uh, there are people who have students, PhD students who are thinking about, maybe there are some interesting problems here that we can think about when they write a thesis or something. I'm saying that I can see already that there's lots of different directions where I can go, that one can go with this thing. And then I would encourage any uh, such a in interested uh, stu student, first of all, to study Montgomery's paper, then also have a look at what we're doing, see if it makes sense, uh, and then study uh, Peter's uh, work from the 90s, late 90s, the joint work with uh, Zev Rudnick and uh, his joint work with uh, Nick Katz, where you can see that instead of pair correlation, one is able to treat high level correlations when you look at three uh, zeros that are close to each other and so on. And also you don't need to fix an L function like we do in this work, but you can talk about families of L functions and so on. So there is a lot more that actually people can, can at least think about. We are only doing in, uh, in our uh, say paper, uh, which we are currently writing. I don't know if you can see uh, this thing, if you can see it on my screen. Yeah, we have something in progress that there's like 40, I don't know, 40 something pages. There's details done here and it's far from being finished. So I'm just saying in, in advance, if someone is interested in doing this, there's lots of actually details that you need to, you need to, to, to be able to work out in order to get any results. Anyway, uh, let's see what we do here. So I look at, let me go back to the function uh, that Montgomery studied is f of alpha and t. I look at the actual definition. So we see we have a double sum here and I look at the inner sum That's what I want to see. The inner sum is a complex number which doesn't have to be a real number and it's not real in, in practice. If you take the double sum, yes, you get the whole thing and then Montgomery showed that f of alpha is real, no problem. But here you have uh, complex numbers and they, in some sense, we can say they, they know a little bit about the pair correlation. At least if we think about these complex numbers, uh, they are arithmetic means, so they're average, is actually our f of alpha, alpha t. So for each zero between, with the imaginary part between zero and capital T, for each fixed zero gamma, we have an inner sum that depends on gamma. So we have a, we compute the inner sum, we get a complex number. I'm interested in the real part, especially because as I said, I'm, I'm interested in some quantities that keep under control or are able to say something about the actual pair correlation conjecture. And we know that this quantity is real, so I, I want to look at the real parts of this thing, right? Okay. So real parts of these sums. Uh, let me go back to this next slide. And that's the real part, okay? Uh, gamma is fixed. We also fix gamma is a zero, or sorry, an imaginary part of a zero between zero and capital T. T is large and alpha is fixed here. 
Then I look at this number, I take the real parts. And I'm curious word? about how, yeah, this I if someone said something I didn't hear, please, please repeat, because I didn't hear. The, you, you've built this function W into your story, what seems yes. to be, uh, you'll have to say in the end that whatever you're doing doesn't depend on W, I assume. Yes. This the, white function yeah, is okay. not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, that's a, that's a mistake. This depends on W. This is uh, W. It should have been S sub W for this thing. Okay. But let's see what happens. Yeah. Because what happens should be independent of W in our uh, opinion. Uh, and uh, we, I look at these numbers. These are now real numbers. Once we take, and there are lots of them. Uh, Cruz. Uh, work in some of these pictures, at least the one that I show, I only show two pictures and he worked with uh, a million zeros, one million zeros of the Riemann zeta function. So the inner sum itself is a sum of one million zeros, sorry, one million zeros, is a sum of one million uh, complex numbers, if these are numbers here, okay. And uh, when we take the real parts, I have one million zeros on the real line. And I want to see how they are distributed. And I do this for each alpha. I want to know what happens if I take t goes to, if I let t go to infinity. This distribution. So with this in mind, let me go quickly. I, uh, oh, capital X is always a t to the alpha. That's our notation. So we define this uh, percolation surface as follows. I take a number alpha, initially it's not zero. I mean, it's not zero here. I take any lambda, a real number, lambda positive and negative, and I want to see how many of those 1 million numbers are very close to this lambda. So what I do is the following. I count them, I normalize them somehow, this, uh, these numbers, and I count how many of them, in this capital A of T, it counts how, basically how many of them after this normalization, are very close to lambda, I and mean, actually in an interval, lambda minus delta, lambda plus delta, I call this A of, of lambda delta, because lambda is a fixed number of interest. I want to see uh, the density of these points around lambda. Well, for what lambdas, I have points there. And then uh, uh, delta is the, the length of, uh, or two, two times delta is the length of the interval here. So I look at the I look at the number of such zeros for which those points are in the interval. I divide by the total number of zeros, which is n of t, and I take the limit as t goes to infinity if it has a limit. So then, if it has a limit for this particular alpha and lambda, the limit as t goes to infinity, and if moreover, after I take this limit. There is a second limit which exists. The limit as delta goes to zero. So if I shrink this interval around lambda, I take smaller and smaller, and I still have points. And I have points in such a way that I divide by two, two delta, which is the length of the interval. I divide by the length of the interval. If this limit exists, so the second limit exists, then we call this G of alpha and lambda. So, so then I'm thinking that for some pairs of numbers, of real numbers, alpha and lambda, maybe this limit exists, and it gives me a, then a point in space at altitude or height, g of alpha and lambda. And I'm curious, what do I get some, if I do this for each alpha and lambda, do I get like a cloud of points in space? Does it look like a surface? How does it look? If this g was a smooth function, then yeah, then I'd say that would be a surface. Yeah of alpha and lambda. In any case, we define it as follows. I take E1 to be the set of points with alpha not zero in R minus zero and uh, lambda in R anyway, for which G of lambda is, is defined. So those two limits, uh, limits exist. And then I extend it uh, by continuity if there is a possibility to do such a thing, but at least by definition, I call E0 the set of points on this vertical line when alpha is zero, this is alpha it is zero, and lambda can be any real number. If this limit exists, the limit now 
when alpha is not zero and alpha goes to zero uh, and the point alpha lambda is in E1, which I don't have any idea how what that set is. But if the limit exists, I call it G of zero and lambda. So E zero is the set of points for which the limit exists. So then I take the union, E1 and the rest of the, the plane and E zero is part of this vertical line where, where the function uh, is defined. So those two limits exist. So then I have a function in G defined on E. I have no idea what G is and I have no idea what capital E is, but as values in R. And I look at the graph of this function and if I call it a pair correlation surface associated with the zeros of the Riemann set of function. As if to say that, uh, as Peter mentioned, as if to say that the W doesn't matter, but anyway, just call it like this. Um, so then Cruz made a picture and it looks like this. My first two reactions, my first reaction was that, oh, I like it a lot. It looks to me like a, like a mountain actually on a sunny day because you see this light, uh, a lot of sun there. You see a light upstairs. I see a little bit of a white here, maybe white spots. It looks like snow. Anyway. I really like it. But then my second reaction was, hey, wait a minute. I don't know that I can trust this picture because you see it's very smooth. And in my opinion, with 1 million zeros, you won't get a picture that, that that's as smooth as this. So Cruz will need to do some explaining later. Why is this mood, what program he's using and so on. It's his, uh, his department, so to speak. He explains to us how he made the picture and why it's so, uh, so smooth. Is the, the program that's smoothing a little bit. Regardless, I saw what I wanted to see. This doesn't look like a, like a cloud of points in space. It does look a, like a surface. So at least conjecturally, we can talk about uh, a pair correlation uh, surface. And it's associated to zeros of the Riemann set function. Uh, not only that, but the, the surface in some sense keeps under control the percolation conjecture. Because the, um, and you see the graph of this function. You see, so in red here, it's just the average. So for each alpha, I guess this is alpha equals one here, I call alpha equals two, three, whatever. But the function f of, la, f of alpha that we saw earlier, the Montgomery's function f of alpha, which was alpha in the interval 0, 1, and constant equal to 1, conjecturally, when alpha is larger than 1, is this. So, so this, this red part is the graph of that, that function. And then when alpha is negative, it's by symmetry you get that. And when alpha is close to 0, I don't see anything here. And I'm not surprised, and I mentioned this earlier. So. Uh, because because you have this this first term in Montgomery's um, theorem that has an influence when alpha is very small compared to t. Now t is a million in this picture, depending. Yeah, log of a million is not that big. Let's put it this way. So uh, what uh, Cruz uh, did, he provided us with part of the graph. Like this, and I and you see this. This is so actually it's two two surfaces here, here, yeah. because this is interrupted here on the left side and it's interrupted on, on the uh, uh, right side by design. But he will show us some other pictures where he also works with alphas with smaller than alpha. When alpha is smaller, that's not a problem. I mean, we are able. If you if you recall uh, Mon uh, Montgomery's theorem, is able to work with alpha between minus one and one. The difficulty is if he tries to push this past a one, that would be the difficulty in our case as well. So we are a bit more able to, to work with alpha small. I just don't put it here because uh, eventually for any fixed lambda, the limit as capital T goes to infinity will take care of the first term. Because if you recall, you have a T to the minus two alpha. Alpha fixed, T goes to infinity, that disappears. And we have a clean limit that's alpha. And then we take, 
this other part of the surface is just the limit after you compute the whole thing. If we had a formula for the surface, we just take alpha go to zero in this and complete this to a surface. Okay. Another thing I noticed, this looks to me like a Gaussian. This is not finished here. So he stopped the computation I think, about, uh, about this place. They would continue a little bit more to the left, a little bit more to the right. And it looks like a Gaussian to me, but also it looks like whatever it is, it looks the same if I take different values of alpha, at least when alpha, alpha is one, two, three, and so on, they look similar to each other. So I'm thinking that this must be just some universal curve. Hopefully that doesn't even depend on that, on that function, on that weight function W. And if that's the case, then it has to be the Gaussian that we know. Somehow, so my interpretation of what's happening here is that there is a Gaussian that's trying to move and uh, let's say a Gaussian curve. It's trying to move in space, create a surface, but in such a way that it's moving along along the pair correlation function. Yeah. And if, but if that's the case, then I should be able at least to state a conjecture what the surface is to give the equation. So we make the following conjecture. The first conjecture is that um, for any alpha, say not zero, we look at what we did before. But now I count here. Yeah, I, I'm trying to say that this is a, for, it, for each pixel alpha, I have a Gaussian distribution. And so in this conjecture, I, I fix a lambda, but I don't look at only those, those numbers after normalization that are close to lambda. I look at those numbers and recall, I, I took real parts. So these are real numbers, but they can be positive and negative, can be very large and very small. So I take all, all of them in the interval from minus infinity to lambda, all these ratios, and I compute their number, say, numerically. And because I have, I already know that I have this shift coming from Montgomery's pair correlation function. This function minimum of one and alpha, if you think about that, it's exactly our function because it's, it's alpha when alpha is in zero one and if alpha is larger than one, it's the minimum is one. So it's, it's our function. So we shift by the, that function and add an, uh, the lambda here. And then I count the proportion because I look at all of them, I divide by the total number and I claim that in the conjecture, I mean, I claim, we made the conjecture because they're the only thing that came to mind because they, they look like uh, like that. Uh, that has to be the Gaussian and then it has to be the limit after uh, our normalization, we have this one over square root two pi and the integral from minus infinity to lambda of this thing, e to minus u square over two du. That's the first conjecture. And then the second conjecture based on this, uh, first conjecture, so consistent with this, now I take any alpha and I really look in a short interval. So based on that conjecture, if I take now a lambda one, lambda two, look in the interval between them and allow them to approach each other and, and look at that conjecture, I would get this thing. If I take the limit now, the earlier limit, if I take those, 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 those one, one million numbers, that what, how, how many we have there, the number increases, how many of them fall in an interval lambda minus delta, lambda plus delta, and then I divide by their numbers. So we look at the proportion. The conjecture, our conjecture is that, yeah, this limit exists as t goes to infinity. And then if I take the second limit and divide by the, by the length of the interval here, the second limit exists, but that's our function g. Yeah. And the limit is this, one over square root two pi, it's very simple function. One over square root two pi e to the minus, and you have this fraction i, the fraction line, and you don't have e to the minus uh, lambda square over two, but you have lambda, you have this shift. It's lambda minus the mean, minus the pair correlation there. So if that's the case, then the pair correlation surface, we say, oh yeah, and then here you can take the limit. No problem, you can take the limit as alpha goes to zero. So you can complete this surface with that scar that you can complete on that vertical line as well when alpha is zero to get a, a true surface in space. 
given by this equation. So it's the graph of this function G, defined on R squared now, that's our the conjecture with value in R and given by this. Oh, maybe we should, because this is very easy, we should compute some values here. And uh, Cruz will show a table. I will uh, look at the picture that he provided me with the actual surface given by this formula to see if it looks like that. And it does seem to me that it looks like the other one, except that it's completed now, no interruptions in the surface. Now, uh, we have a result, or we have a couple of results. And um, so the first one is, again, assuming the Riemann hypothesis. The second result is, is you know, unconditional. We don't, don't need to assume the Riemann hypothesis we're able to say some things, but the ranges are smaller in which you can say some things. So theorem one is as follows. Assume R H, then uh, take any sequence alpha J going to zero. Um, as slowly as you want. I don't want it to go to zero, but out of necessity, I have to take it to go to zero because otherwise I'm not able to prove that. But if I take a sequence that eventually goes to zero slowly, then we can do the following. Um, so you can take a sequence that goes slowly to zero, but it's still, uh, the, the alphas are large enough. So then the first term in Montgomery's theorem uh, is annihilated completely. So indeed, uh, the result is about what happens with the actual percolation uh, surface. Then we say that there is an increasing sequence. Normally, you would say there is a sequence alpha j and the sequence tj in increasing sequence tj. So then you, if you take for this alpha j and that tj, tj to the alpha j, you look at the numbers, you subtract, of course, the shift, which is the minimum, as we said, is the, the percolation function of Montgomery. The minimum of alpha and one is alpha because we are in alphas, our alphas are small, smaller than one, they will eventually go to zero. So it's exactly alpha j, but this is important. You take this, remove that, and we do prove that the limit is indeed exactly as we conjecture. Um, but actually, this is a stronger statement that we have here than what I just said. Take any sequence alpha j goes, go, that, go to, that goes to zero. Then there is a sequence vj with the following property. I don't have to take tj to be equal to vj. I can take uniformly tj to, be, uh, to, to move anywhere in the, uh, this infinite interval from vj to plus infinity. So then any sequence with tj larger than vj, and then we do have this limit. Um, so in some sense, theorem one is, we can say it's as close as possible to conjecture one while failing to prove any single case, even a single case of the conjecture, because to, to prove one case of a conjecture, you need to prove the conjecture for a, one particular value of alpha. We are not able to do this. We are forced to take alpha to go to zero. And I'll tell you in a moment uh, why is it that we are forced to let alpha go to zero. Um, yeah, but we can, do, we can do so as slowly as we want. And one can establish unconditional results uh, towards conjecture, but the ranges are, are uh, far weaker. For instance, you, you have something like that that looks identical to that like a Xero's copy of the previous uh, theorem, let alpha j be any sequence. And this is unconditional. We can prove this not uh, uh, under no assumption. We don't assume a Riemann hypothesis here. But now, of course, even to define this, you define it with a row there, because we don't know that the row is one half plus i gamma. Rho is uh, some beta plus i gamma, or some, some numbers. We don't assume the, the real parts of these non-trivial zeros are, are equal to one half. But then we can still consider those numbers. We can take the real parts, and then uh, we look at uh, all zeros with imaginary parts between zero and, uh, and uh, capital T, or Tj here. Subtract uh, 
exactly alpha j as we know the shift with the uh, uh, Montgomery's function and count how many are less than lambda and we get exactly that limit again and you see it doesn't depend on the I say it doesn't depend on Montgomery's uh, weight function, but uh, but actually I am I am lying, in the sense that we didn't work with a general function. We only work with this function. Expected, expect, uh, and we expected that this will not depend on the function, and it didn't. It gives me the Gaussian. So unless by pure luck. It's uh, this surface, it's, uh, you have the Gaussian moving only for uh, Montgomery's pair correlation, which I don't believe it can happen. Uh, then, yeah, as you can see that the, that the surface is independent of this. And, and actually the computations can be done without the reserve function, that's, that's very clear. So if I think about the proof now, yeah, I, one can do the proof, yeah, no problem. I mean, this, you can translate this to a sum over primes. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and what is it you're saying about what are you inputting about prime? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. P P Peter uh, thought that it's a good idea to spoil uh, <laughs> the surprise by telling everybody how it's done. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I just, I just wanted to. I, I will go to that immediately. What we do about uh, the primes. Um, the, the the difference here is that we don't have the only difference between this theorem and the other one, which is which is conditional assuming R H and the ranges, is that you don't have T J to D alpha J. You get log of T J to D alpha J. So the so results are exponentially better, so to speak, if you assume R H. Yeah, but the result is the same. I mean, it's the same phenomenon, the same uh, Gaussian distribution. Yeah. So as is usually the case. Uh, we study this by looking at moments. All right. So what we do in order to do that, I, I will, have, I will actually stop very quickly because I, I really wanted us to look at some some pictures and see what uh, uh, what Cruz has to say. But let me only give an idea. Again, if if someone really wants to to look at all the details, uh, we. We have the details here in, a, in, a, in the paper. But here I just wanted to say one thing. If you want to get the distribution by using moments, then you need to do all the moments and you need to get the moments, the moments to match exactly these after some normalization, exactly those moments that appear in the, in the Gaussian distribution and normalize properly. And you need to do this for each alpha. And then you, you subtract that alpha. And then the same constants need to appear always. Uh, what that, for all the odd moments, this this is should be zero. You need to get zero. And you uh, and this double factorial is just the product of odd numbers from one up to n minus one. Odd numbers. Uh, instead of yeah saying anything about that, about this proofs, let me actually go back to exactly the place where um, um, Peter said something about how you attack this. What Montgomery would do, let, let me actually go. Okay, go quickly. Actually, why not? I can go to the beginning. This is not, uh, yeah. Just to give the idea why conceptually you can do something, but not, but not too much. When you look at moments, if, I, if you look at the inner sum here, the first moment is itself. So this is done by Montgomery. So what we are doing is exactly um, a, um, a generalization of Montgomery's work from our point of view. That is the first moment, what he did, and we do all the moments. So of course we face every single difficulty that he faced. And our first moment, um, has as a restriction alpha less than one, as in Montgomery. So it's not better, it's not worse than his work. But to handle the second moment of, or okay, the second moment, uh, we can show that it works and it gives exactly what we conjecture, provided alpha is less than one over two. 
And if we get the 10th moment for alpha less than one over 10, we get exactly the moment from the Gaussian distribution that we expect. Uh, why is this stronger and stronger restriction? I mean, we shouldn't be surprised that this, when you work with moments, I mean, you take higher and higher moments, usually problems become more and more difficult, but it's not, I'm just trying to say one thing. It's not, um, it's not a matter of being uh, lucky to do better than Montgomery or being stupid and not being able even to do what should be the, the proper analog. There is some intrinsic uh, optical there that is the same in case of, of Montgomery. So what Montgomery did, or, or uh, say conceptually what someone can do, we know, we have explicit formulas that relate a sum over zeros with a sum over primes. So instead of the inner sum, that's already a sum over zeros, we can put instead of this, a sum over primes, which Montgomery did say, or an, uh, an equivalent way, so to speak, to this. But then that's not, you're not done entirely. Eventually you will use the prime number theorem and that would be enough to find the asymptotic formula and get your alpha when you take the sum over primes. But that's not immediate because you still have the exterior sum, which is a sum over these gammas. So the interior sum depends on gamma. So you have a sum over prime, but it depends on a zero gamma as, as well. So it's some mixture of uh, zeros. You still have one zero and uh, a sum over primes. So we're thinking that, yeah, eventually one will need again to do a second, uh, to use again um, an explicit formula to move again from the sum over zero to finally a full sum, a clean sum over primes only, which is what Montgomery did. So, but in our case, once we apply this uh, explicit formula first, because if you don't apply the explicit formula, then you run into other problems. You need to raise this, and then you worry about the zeros because you have a multiple sum over zeros. But we first, what we did here, at least in this approach, and one can think about other ways, we use an explicit formula to move from a sum over zeros to a sum over primes. Except that, yeah, in explicit formula, you have a, you have a sum over all the zeros, so you have some details to work out. I mean, this is a finite sum. You have to see what happens with those, with those gammas that are close to T because this is not a true representation, not a correct um, representation of what the, the total sum, what the infinite sum over, over them is. So you, so you don't use immediately um, explicit formulas. But leaving these details aside, we have explicit formula that will give us a sum over primes. But then what we did is, what we do is we take the nth moment of this sum over primes. So this give us, this gives us a, a multiple sum or M consecutive sum if you want. Um, and then inside you don't have a prime, a sum over prime. You have a products of M, M prime. So P1 times P2 times P3 and so on. And if, if we keep in mind that each P has to be eventually less than capital T uh, in Montgomery's work, meaning that alpha, I mean, you take, so the primes go up to T to the alpha. That, that's, the, that's what happens here. And then if you, are, if you only have a prime and, and you have then the restriction alpha has to be less than one in Montgomery's work, but in our case, if each, if each prime is up to T to the alpha and you have uh, the mth moment, then the product of such primes, and you have a huge number of primes, huge number and their size also is much larger, it is like T to the M times alpha. So for the mth moment, the obstruction that appears in Montgomery's treatment and other treatments that came since then appears in our case, when you do the end, end moment, when M alpha is becomes larger than one. So in conclusion, we can do this when M, we can do the moments when M alpha is M times alpha, I mean, is less than one. And in particular, we can do the first moment when M is one, we get, uh, we recover uh, Montgomery's result. 
But when uh, when we take the second moment, and then we need uh, alpha to be less than one half, or alpha to be less than one third, and so on. So we have results theorems that just give the moments, and it gives so the moments in the ranges where they work. Second moment is in zero one half. Fourth moment is in zero one uh, one fourth. Third moment is zero one third one over t, and so on. They do match our expectation and what was done in what, what was said in the conjecture. Uh, so even these moments, if we even if we don't transform them directly in the form of a theorem like theorem one, they are still consistent with the conjecture because the moments, if we assume the con conjecture, those moments have to be there. In fact, in larger intervals, but in those that we can get are consistent. But lastly, to get theorem, to get theorem one, we needed all the moments. So that's why we, we needed our alpha to eventually get below one half so we can use the second moment, eventually below one four to use the four moment and so on. That's why our sequence alpha j had to go to zero. We don't care how slowly, but if eventually it goes to zero, then we know that eventually we can use that moment, uh, those moments. So uh, I guess I spoke too much. Let me ignore if there was any other uh, um, page that needed to be covered. I would like to ask uh, Cruz to continue and show us some numerical evidence, some pictures, some animation, whatever he did. Cruz, are you, can you hear me, Cruz? Oh. Yes, yes. Okay, um, I'll go through this quite quickly because I don't think there's that much time left, but I do want to explicitly talk about our data set because if we don't talk about that, then it wouldn't be clear what the pictures are. So our data set uh, is consists of these S values, which professors are SQ defined beforehand. And these S values depend on three parameters. It's alpha, T, and gamma, and they vary in the following way. So T corresponds to the imaginary part of either the uh, the 10,000 zero, the 100,000 zero, the million zero. Uh, maybe I might just talk about the million zero data uh, based off of time, but uh, yeah. And then we have that the gamma corresponds, of course, to imaginary part of a zero um, of zeta that's less than T, and of course it's positive. We also have our alphas varying in the following way. So it's 0 0.01, and then you increase by that until you get to three. So you have like 300 values of alpha. Uh, the way I like to think about this data set is that you fix the T and you fix the alpha. And what you have for each of those points is you have uh, NAT values of S. And then of course they all could um, cor uh, correspond to a zero of zeta. Another cool thing is that since this is even and alpha, we also have, you can really think of this as being plus or minus uh, and all these values here because we get those for free because it's even. Just quickly mentioning that these zeros were pulled from Platt's database on the L function. So right you, here. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yes. This database just got a list of how many zeros? And so how, so how, how um, many decimals in each zero? It's uh, the... For the zeros that I use, it's uh, 16 significant digits that's used uh, that I use for it. But the one that Platt has is way more extensive. Um, but in terms of you know our computations, we have that it's accurate up to 16 significant digits. So I think that's for this that that's like within 10 to the negative nine. I think uh, for our data set that we used. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll skip a little bit of this, but right here, what we have plotted, we have Montgomery's function plotted. Um, the T here is corresponding to the million zero. And so those are the red dots and you can see here's the shape. And of course, Zarescu uh, mentioned that when alpha is close to zero, uh, these red dots go up and they're around like log T, which in this case is like 10 or something like that. So these orange dots is um, the result of Montgomery's theorem. And you can see that the shape of the Montgomery's function is very well um, explained by this theorem, sharp decrease, linear growth, and then a flat lines after one. And then this is what we expect on the limit. And you can see that. So this picture right here, the animation, um, it's an unnormalized version of the one that you saw earlier that Professor Zarescu talked about, about the mountains. So what's going on right here is we have an alpha dimension 
uh, a lambda dimension and a z dimension, which corresponds to the probability. So alpha, um, what you can think of what's happening is you have a slice. It's like you imagine the slicing this and looking at the alpha dimension. And what you're doing is you're taking, in this case, it's a, we're using the million zeros of zeta, the first million. And what you can imagine what we're doing is we're taking that set, we're putting into bins. We do about 500 bins. And we count, we figure out what's the probability that an S value is in that bin. And what you can see is we start off over here when alpha is really small, this corresponds to 0 0.01. Um, it looks like a skewed normal distribution. But as you move, move over, and there's a change of behavior that happens at 0.2, where it starts to look more normal. It's no longer looking that skewed. And as you go on, the standard deviation is increasing, as you can see here. And then what's happening next is that at the value at alpha is equal to one, it flatlines and at the standard deviation is basically the same throughout the whole time. Okay, so that's that bit, that animation. I'll skip over this and there's still the time. So the ACE function is our standard deviation. Um, these This is computed at the million zero of zeta. And these are the red dots are the exact actual data. This orange thing is what our theoretical like computations got us. And then this blue line is the asymptotic for it. Of course, um, in the asymptotic, this guy doesn't play a role, but um, since T isn't that large with respect to uh, the log, it's sort of like 600,000, because this is like corresponding to the million zero zeta, um, there's some gap. But the shape does a very, very good job of explaining it. And if we include this min term, which actually pops up in our, in our work, um, you get it looks like this. Uh, the next thing is we have these tables of moments. Um, these are the first two moments corresponding to Montgomery's function, the mean, and then we have the standard deviation. We have some select alpha values. And over here, we have some central moments. So in the gray ones, these are the odd moments. And as you can see, they're very close to zero, which is exactly what you expect for the normal distribution. And then in the EVA moments, uh, for example, the fourth one, the value is supposed to be three. And as you can see, it's pretty close to three. Uh, it's like 2.8 something. And then in general, in the sixth moment, you expect it to be 15. And here we can see it's like 13. Over here, it's 14. But um, in general, like when your alpha is small, it's not as close to what you expect. And that's because of like the first term of Montgomery's function, if you think about it. Um, is kind of controlling what's going on when alpha is small, rather than the alpha term that uh, is in Montgomery's theorem. And so the last thing I want to show is uh, animation of what Professor Zaresky showed earlier. And the, well, the way that this graph differs from the previous one, the one I showed earlier, is that this one's normalized to have um, standard deviation uh, one and the and the mean to be just Montgomery's function. The reason why you would want to do that is because the standard deviation goes to infinity because it's like square root log t. And then also there's this gap right here, which I will pause it right here. This gap, and so this point right here, this corresponds to alpha point two. And the reason why we put the gap here is because there's a change of behavior there. That's when like the first term of Montgomery's theorem is controlling. Uh, the value of f of alpha rather than alpha itself. Yeah. Sorry for the quick, if there's any questions, please let me know. And uh, yeah. And I think, Cruz, we can finish because it's it's time. Yeah. There are any questions? Yeah, I have one question. Suppose I assume the n level correlation conjectures. Can I not derive your Gaussian, or is, it, is there more information in the Gaussian hidden somewhere? Oh, the, the answer is I, I don't know. I don't know about Cruz because we did not think about this. Oh. Because they That's an important about... question, I realize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know. Okay, this is a question. Um, you I, may, uh, since you haven't, uh, I mean, your function seems to have more information. You, you you took a function which is supposed to square. You've kind of taken one half of it, looked at the statistics. So maybe there is more information in your function. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I thought only a little bit. I wasn't able to get it from the N-level correlation. Yeah. Okay. So maybe there is more information. So, so yeah. So from this point of view, it may be of interest to continue to study this. Yeah. This mm -hmm. I have a second question, if you have a second. Um, there's something called murmurations that I learned about a few years ago. Are you familiar with that, what that means? Mm -hmm. Have you heard the word murmuration? No. Okay. Can you explain? In, uh... <laughs> okay. <laughs> that one, but, uh, or in, or you talk about it if you want. Please. I'll just say what it is, and, and maybe you can actually study it here. It's a feature where in these say one level density or these places like in Montgomery where you have a change in the behavior as you go through one, you can try and understand how that change, how that behavior changes explicitly. It's like uh, when alpha is less than one, it's, uh, it's uh, linear, then it becomes, uh, this function is continuous. So it's less dramatic than in the low lying zeros where the function is discontinuous. So you get a function which is one value when you're less than a particular value and another value when you're bigger than that. And you could try and understand if there's a behavior of oh. how it transitions from the one to the other. Yeah. I, I, and, the, and, you, and some machine learning people found this out. Anyway, it seems like you're not familiar with it, but I'll send you some stuff on it. <laughs> and I'm sure there's a murmuration at Montgomery's pair correlation that's worth understanding, which is some universal new curve is how you go from the one as you at, at the transition. The way I like to think about it is, say you take the Bessel function, jkx, and you look at it as a function of two variables. You look at Watson's book on Bessel functions. Most of the book is about when x is large, you have one behavior, when k is less than x, when k is bigger than x, another behavior, and when k is near x, there's a new behavior, when k is within one third of yeah, yeah. Times, times x, and you get a new function called an airy function, which is 19th century gem. Comes up all over the airy function. So there's a similar thing going on here. But I, if you haven't seen it, then you don't know what I'm talking about. And I gave a lecture on Zoom a year and a half ago or two years ago, and somebody said, Well, what about murmurations? And I was like, You, what on earth are you talking about? <laughs> okay. So I'll update you on that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? People from Zoom? If not, let's thank Sandra.